<laughs> hello, everybody. My dog is already saying hello, too. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> my, my Uncle Benny is... My Uncle Benny's coming down the driveway and the dogs are trying to protect me, I guess. Ah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Yes. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sounder, made for the Sounder of Lady Hoggers. I am Molly from the Copper Penny Farm, and I got my friends over here as usual. Go ahead, friends. Ah, thank you for the lead in. I can catch it that time. I am Laura Jensen, the pig nerd. Um... What's happening for me? The master class is this weekend. That's my Mayshawn master class. We go over, over all things Mayshawn. Really excited about the marketing part because I feel like that's something that so many small farmers um, need to have a, a better awareness of. Um, personal life, we're just trying to keep the grass cut and get things cleaned up for that. And I uh, couldn't be more excited with our subject today uh, and, and my friends here. Yes. So I'm Amanda Buck with uh, Buck Family Ranch, and we are just um, chipping away at the week, really. We um, have been letting our chickens out to free range a lot more than we had been, which is exciting. They're happier. They're laying more eggs, um, which is good. And you may hear them. I am outside right now, and they're surrounding me. So. <laughs> 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 That's why I mentioned that. But other than that, we're just just trucking, trucking away. We don't have any major big things happening. Um, so yeah, that's that's I'm excited to talk about what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm really excited about this one. Cool. Well, uh at least you got chickens just surrounding you. I got a bunch of damn barking ass dogs, obviously. <laughs> and and hogs. I mean, it is what it is. But anyways. Out here on the penny farm, we are fencing today because me and Uncle Penny are fencing because it is quite out of control. Uh, <laughs> quite out of control. I got, I got hogs everywhere, and uh, they are rooting up my entire yard again that I just got fixed. So we're going to fix that today. Well, all right. All righty. So now that we've done a little bit, y'all ready to get to talking? Let's do it. All righty. So today we're going to dive in a little bit right we're going to mm -hmm. go back previous episodes i think we're going to go back maybe 10 episodes and start off and then we're going to mix in a little bit of each episode right so we're going back to basically like we said like a who made who kind of deal right yeah yeah who made who and who made you i will start singing acdc although i'd really love to but uh, <laughs> right so, yeah we're gonna go we're gonna go to that and we're going to go a little off topic and we're going to dive into our food chain and, you know, what's going on, what's going on with the production of our food, who's controlling us, but how did we get here as well? And uh, Amanda, you and Laura have been doing some research because if anybody knows me, they know that I do not research. I fly from the hip, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So Amanda and Laura, y'all got some articles together. So let's start off with a uh, let's start off with an article and we'll talk about it. All right, so I'm just going to dive in, y'all. This uh, this gets in the deep end of the pool pretty fast, but we're uh, we're excited. So uh, I'm I'm working with an article from American Thinker. It was written May 5th of 2020, and it, and and excerpts from it today. The Chinese own armor and famous Smithfield hams, together with the most quintessential quintessential American brand of all, Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs, with its iconic annual eating contest. Uh, it goes on to say uh, that with that purchase, the Chinese owned one in four pigs raised in the U.S. and by adding 146,000 acres, continued to be the world's largest buyer of American farmland. It goes on to say that food is poised to become the all of the 21st century with demand increasing for a scarce resource. The CCP identified meat processing as a strategically important industry and with the Smithfield acquisition, China gained access to the world's most advanced animal processing technology. Finally, the Chinese consume half of the world's pork production. 
That's a big one. Half of the world's pork production. Pork supply is so important to them, just as the U.S. government maintains a strategic oil reserve, China stashes away vast amounts of frozen pork in case of shortages, outbreaks of swine disease, or more. Down the road, if this continues and we ship a lot of product to China, certainly I think we in America could see shortages, particularly on hams and bellies, admitted Smithfield, Smithfield's director of procurement. That's some heavy stuff. Did I, when I heard Nathan's, although I got it wrong on who actually produces Nathan's, so I'm sorry about that. I will not say what I said. Um, but it could have started that way and what, what you said was you thought it started from a small family farm and yeah so yes. i mean it certainly could have yeah and i i was i did not know that and so i'm very blown away by that mm -hmm. because think, it goes against it goes against everything that i thought nathan's was mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I mean, when I think of Nathan's, I seriously just think of the hot dog eating contest that happens on the 4th of July. Well, yeah. uh, hot dogs in my store have a cult following. We use a Black Angus brand that is a, a U.S. brand. Um, and we had a customer tell us just last week, I'm writing an email to Nathan's and telling them, get out of the way. You got them beat. And I thought, yeah. man, if we'd have known at that point what we learned today about there's not even an American-owned company anymore. Um, yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had Nathan's as my, as the hot dogs and the corn dogs at my wedding, man. You know? Oh, wow. I was like, yeah. Oh. I was like, damn, I wish you could go take it back now. But anyway, <laughs> uh, no, to me, to me, it is very bizarre. I, well, I say bizarre, but it's not bizarre. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just find it, it's disheartening at the same time, but it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes that those are the ones that are owned now and they're not even American. And it is because everybody, everybody that you know, we're eating Nathan's hot dogs. We're eating Smithfield. We're eating all that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, Hormel, uh, owned yep. by the Chinese. Um, yep. Applegate is a Hormel brand. Um, yep. Uh, the only thing that I found as a positive when I looked at all the, the major um, pork producers is that Tyson still, uh, of course, that's chicken, but I say that because Tyson owns Wright Bacon, which is another player. Um, Tyson's the only um, American-owned large producer that I could find. Now, I'll also but say that it was difficult to find information, which I also find a little concerning. <laughs> but but you have to look at it, though. Although Tyson is still American-owned or or supposedly American owned, mm -hmm. look how many plants are shutting down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a whole nother thing that we need to dig into. When, when you look at what we just said, and, and we've known this, this is no secret. When you look at how big China is becoming as a player in, in ag, and then you learn that they're buying up lands and that their, their concern is their people, just like it should be for Americans. Who do you think is gonna gonna uh, win if, uh, let's say, the African swine fever hits and there's a pork shortage? Do you think the Chinese are gonna pick us to eat or them to eat? Exactly. I don't. That didn't sound right. Well, no, Not eat us right. to eat food. <laughs> yeah, but but also though, uh, it is kind. It speaks on so many different levels because you know it's like we as Americans are putting our money the money that we're getting right above ourselves and our lives and our food. Most Americans have no idea what they're supporting. And, 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 and look at us. We, we feel like we're educated, like the average consumer and we didn't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think too, it's just interesting. <laughs> it's just interesting, you know, all the things, one, them buying all these companies and lands and things like that it being difficult to research it it being difficult to kind of like connect the dots and and really figure it out and when you look at it another article that we looked at too was talking about their uh the u.s trade with china and i want to read i want to read it just so i'm not misquoting it um where was it? Let me see. This is in an article from, it's called China's Threat to American Food Security, and it was written in June of 22. 
And it says that, okay, it starts out by saying China has been buying up American farmland and for some reason people aren't worried about it. Maybe they're unaware that China's American agricultural land holdings have increased over tenfold in the last decade. Maybe they're unaware that at the beginning of 2020, investments from China held $2 billion of American agricultural land. Maybe they're unaware that 2021 was the 10th straight year America's trade deficit with the Chinese eclipsed $300 billion. Maybe they're unaware that China owns 50% of the global reserves of corn. And then it goes on to talk more. And again, this isn't just like, it, it's the Chinese Communist Party and the government of the People's Republic of China that, that owns these things. So it's just, it's really kind of scary when you think about that and how kind of under the radar it's been. It's been very sly, very under the radar and... We want to, I know myself as a human, I want to believe that there's good in the world, that people are not going to intentionally do things to really hurt others. But I think that all of this going on is not to create good for the American people. It's to cause harm. And so I think that oh, no. it, while it, it, it may be protecting the Chinese, it's definitely not doing anything positive for Americans and by us continuing to give our dollars to these companies, we're supporting what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think that, you know, I think that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate everybody to understand, you know, mm -hmm. we're in this, we're in this every day. We're in this every day. And we are just now realizing all of this. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. You know, um, go ahead, Molly. At, we're just now realizing all this, and it's because, you know, it's what we're doing, but also from the podcast. You know, we're trying to come up with things or whatever. But that's what makes it so interesting and what really, uh, you know, I feel very forceful about in educating people is because I don't think anybody would even go to Google this or even go to research this if we weren't putting it out there. Uh, I didn't research it until this morning as we were preparing for the podcast. Um, and like yeah. I like I had shared, it, it is it is concerning how hidden this stuff is. Um, and I don't I don't need a name and address. I'm not that kind of crazy. Uh, I just would like to know what you know what nation does does you know these things operate? Where do they come from? Um, and, and I think that this is yeah. great timing on the heels of COVID. So. Y'all know that I was one of those food businesses that grew exponentially in a positive way from COVID. We've talked about that in other episodes. That was that was a crisis. Uh, we're not in crisis right now. Um, however, I want everybody to think back to that moment when the grocery store shelves went bare and the panic washed across the country. And did any of these big corporations from all these other countries make sure you and your family got to eat? No, that would be a resounding no. Where did they turn to us uh, small farms? Um, I fed more people, um, you know, than the local grocery stores could. And I made sure that my people and my community and my family ate. And that's still my goal in what I do. So I share that to say that that everyone listening to this podcast now has this information, too. And while we're not in crisis mode Take this information and do with it what you will. But now is the time to plan and prepare. Um, I think, Amanda, you had some great points as we were hashing it out earlier about, you know, what does it look like for the supply chain uh, to, to make this uh, make this shift and in, in, in turn in this direction? Yeah, I mean, you know, we in previous podcast episodes have talked about big or small support them all and how you know, the large, large scale depends on us, just like we depend on them. And I feel like if we just make the shift to say, oh, well, we're not, we're not going to support large anymore because of who owns them. I don't think we can do that at the, at the flip of a switch. I think it's something that we have to do little by little. Um, 
I think creating awareness like we're doing today is going to be really beneficial. I also think that, you know, the more we can help get the word out there that these some really large, you know, previously owned American companies are now owned owned ugh, by foreign entities, mostly China. Um, I yep. hope that that will kind of stir in Americans like we need to take a little more responsibility for our food, our supply chain and where we are spending our U.S. dollars because mm -hmm. hard. I don't care who you are. Um, if you are an employed American right now, you are working so hard, so hard to put food on your table with inflation the way it is right now, even though they say it doesn't exist and it's going down, it's not. I think uh, that, yeah. yes, <laughs> with inflation, what it is now, um, it's just, it's so hard. And I think that if we can take a little more responsibility for either raising our own food or supporting local and saying, we're not willing to give us dollars to China we're going to do it here. And I think that if we can have more people start to provide and step up to the plate as small farmers to begin providing, we can slowly make that transition from being so dependent on Chinese owned companies or even foreign owned companies that are providing our food supply. Large scale farms are not a bad thing. Foreign owned large scale farms or businesses are not going to benefit the U S in the long run. So I, I feel like that's where you kind of have to make that. It, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word. I feel like that's kind of where you have to really research and kind of find it's a fine line and it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to figure it out. You have to be able to look, okay, who owns this? Who owns that? Who owns the next thing to really get down? And it's really hard to do that and get a clear answer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think I think that's where we, we've got to start. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's education on everything, man. It's education on what you're eating, what you're consuming. It's education on where that is coming from, how that's getting there. You know, it's a lot of things and it is hard for people to find those things. But at the end of the day, you know, what is what is the most valuable to you? I mean, you're an American citizen. You want to be healthy. You know, where, where are you going to put your dollars at? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and who's looking out for you? You know, uh, <laughs> is it some uh, international multi-billion dollar conglomeration uh, that's about the bottom line and whatever chemicals it takes to get the shelf life to get there? Or is it the farmers like the three of us that are out there busting butt just trying to make it so that we can all eat clean and healthy? Yeah. Well, and that's another that's another point I want to make too. I don't, I, this is not about make the small farmer rich. No, no. that's no, almost no. impossible by the way. I can tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is, it is impossible. It is not because when you, when you look at it, us small farmers, we're not, we don't have the money. We're not in it for the money. Well, you we know, have the highest the lifestyle. It's for the, yeah. And our, our inputs are too high. We can't compete. We can't compete on every level except for we're small and we care. Yes. And we care. This is to, to really inform people about what your intake is. And I don't think you mm -hmm. understand truly, you don't care about or truly understand what your intake is until you get into the farming. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it also... It's that, Molly, but I also think it is kind of sounding the alarm. Like what I did there, sounding on the sounder. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounding the alarm and saying this this is kind of a red flag. Yeah. Like if this if this yes. much, this much food is being supplied to the US by China. If they decide they don't want to do that anymore, we're screwed. We you know? It, it, we it's, it's, it's one word. It's basic. It's control. Yeah. 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 Well, you look at I some mean, of the other, I mean, like the article that I mentioned earlier from The Hill, 
where it was talking about, um, this is from the US China Economic Security and Review Commission. This is a quote from them. If further consolidations and Chinese investments in US agricultural assets take place, China may have undue leverage over US supply chains. They're doing this, that was the end of the quote. And the rest of the article, it did say they're doing this by purchasing agribusinesses and land in the U.S., but they're reducing U.S. competitiveness because of doing that. Um, they're stealing intellectual property and creating bioweapons using DNA from genetically modified American crops. And, you know, not, none of that's good that's scary <laughs> as hell that's what that is that that is i would usually say another word here but we try to keep it molly you say it <laughs> it's, it's fucking frightening man there yeah. that that <laughs> and i guess maybe we shouldn't laugh but i mean that the insanity and the craziness of it i mean this shit's real you know we're not this isn't being made up this isn't for for you know ratings or views this is the world we live in yeah and i feel like you you hear bits and pieces like oh like i can remember being no. back in my in my former life as a hairdresser i can remember being in our hair salon in 2013 and hearing that the chinese were buying smithfield i remember that mm -hmm. and thinking holy crap what mm -hmm. and I feel like we hear yeah. bits and pieces and bits and pieces here and there, but then when you really stop and look at how how much they really own, it's very mm -hmm. it's frightening. it is scary because it really just would take them deciding we're not doing this anymore, and then all of a sudden we're in a really bad place, worse than we already are. Well, and let, let's look at well, this strategically as Americans. If it, okay, let's say we know that to be true, what is America doing? to sure up and ensure we have a solid food supply otherwise they're raising grocery prices and everybody can't afford their own food and then they're telling us inflation doesn't exist you know i can tell yeah. you from a from a grant perspective there's another round of grants to improve and upfit slaughterhouses and places like mine i can also tell you and i'm just going to go ahead and be pissed about it is that is not for people like us I do not have the resources. I do not have deep enough pockets. I do not have the time to jump through all the flaming hoops on fire to actually get that. So I'm not sure who it's for, but it is not really going to work as intended, in my opinion. So so it's, what are they doing? It, Nothing. It's not, it's not, it's not created. We're not, there's no plans really to help us. Prices oh, yeah. are out of control. Yeah. Prices, prices are out of control. Uh, on everything, not just your own, not the food that you, not just the food that you buy from the grocery store, but the prices are, are in, inflated on just the supplies that you need to survive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that some of the solutions that they are trying to roll out are things like fake meat. You yeah. know, like, there you go, you know, like <laughs> stuff like that. But yes, I, Prices all around are so, so high. And, you know, it kind of makes it. So I know for our family, with the way I had a friend recently tell me that she read an article. So this is total hearsay because it's from a friend who read an article. I don't know what the article was, but they were talking about inflation in the U.S. and how currently the average American household is having to spend $700 more per month to live exactly like they were last year. Meanwhile, yeah. salaries are not increasing by that much. So I know our family is majorly feeling that. When I go to budget groceries and I make a meal plan and I'm budgeting things, there are times that I have, I'm putting things back or um, I'm having to buy like foods that I wouldn't typically buy because of them being more processed than what I'm comfortable with. But that's what we can afford. Yeah. And so yep. I feel like we're having to make, you know, big decisions on, on things. And so that's, I feel like that's another way that this is all scary because it's like, if things are already so expensive that we're having to make decisions like that, and I'm not the only one, I feel like there's families all over making those kinds of decisions when it yes. comes to the you're putting on the table. Um, so if you're doing those things, 
if we have these other companies that are not owned by the U.S. and they decide to do things that are going to be harmful to American citizens, it's just going to be a really, really, really big mess, way bigger than what it is. And not to like fear monger and stuff, but just we got to We got to fix. We got to change something. We got to find a fix for this. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's not just, you know, the the them buying all of them, owning all those things, but also look at what they own and how many of those plants in the U S have shut down. Yeah. yeah I, I'd like to research that more. I think that's a whole nother episode and why and where is it going? I mean, it, to me, it appears as though they're trying to send, uh, send the demand their way. I mean, the deficit shows that three, what was it? 300 million, 300 billion. Billion with a B. B. Yeah. For straight. As of 2021, the trade deficit with China was at 300 billion. I can't yeah. believe that's improved. Yeah, I mean, it's, no. it's, it's just, you know, there's so many things. And like, uh, like Amanda always says, you know, we need to get out the tax and the yarn, you know, but it, yeah. it, it is all, it's all connected. Homer, stop barking. Um, <laughs> it's all, it, sorry about that. It's, I, I made, a, I made a mistake by giving him a tennis ball and I'd rather, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> so so it's it's all it's all connected, man. You know, we we go to the COVID pandemic. You know, that made everybody so scared to death. They came to us as small farmers. We did all that we got to do. Well, then China keeps on buying more things and more things. And then at the end of the COVID pandemic, you know, there's been more companies sell out and do more, you know, that cut us even more back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and instead of people, instead of people keeping it up with us and helping us provide them as true Americans, helping us provide for them, they went straight back to the grocery stores to buy what we don't even own. Yeah, 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 and, I, and I've talked about that in previous episodes. Um, I was, I was really hurt by that for a long time. Um, and I, and I, it still bites. I ain't gonna lie. Um, but I think we've seen an increase in volume in the store in the last couple of weeks. And, and I, I, I think that Americans are becoming more aware. I think that there's probably more yeah. out there now than there was even six months ago that are really starting to see this and understand this. And, and I think that what we, what we say resonate resonates with a lot of Americans uh, and how they feel and what they, uh, what they choose to do with their dollar. I agree. Yeah. I I have seen more and more recently um, people not being so like living underneath a rock. Like I feel like people are not so blindly trusting the misinformation that we get from the news or what you're commonly seeing. I, I feel like people are starting to really question things and kind of dig a little deeper and researching a little more on their own to make more educated decisions. But I also think that there are still a lot of people out there who, even if they have that information, they just can't afford to make a change at this time. And so right. it's, it's, I feel like a lot of people are caught between a rock and a hard place. And so I guess in my mind, that kind of turns it around on us. Yes. How do, what, what do we do as small farmers to make this easier on the American public? Like what do we do to help the American consumer, but not run ourselves ragged? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I think that there's an awareness that needs to happen on small farms. <clears throat> You're right. I mean, we, we have to have a positive number at the end of the day, Yeah. but how can we do it strategically? You know, one of the things that I always try to do is offer bulk ground beef and bulk uh, chicken breast that I work with, with farms on that, you know, are essentially bulk bags that I don't really have to um, alter the packaging because that's where it gets really expensive yeah. for the small butcher shop. And, you know, if, if, if you ladies had consumers come to you um, when you were producing or as you're producing products and say, how can you work with me? You know, can you, can you make a ground pork or a ground lamb? Or is there a bulk way that you could, 
communicate and connect with a consumer on how they could at least get something going because the more people that would come to any of the three of us, if we each picked up, heck, even five customers that would do that regularly and make us their provider for that, that would yeah. be the difference in making it in growth in each of our farms, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, you know, so I started selling my first pork, right? Mm -hmm. You know. And, uh, you know, I've been preaching about the difference in the pork and all this. And, you know, I, I lowered my prices a little bit for, to make it kind of affordable for people just to get it into their freezers for them to be able to eat it, for them to be able to see the difference, sure. you know, yeah. and, uh, I did bulk pricing. I did a bunch of stuff, but it was, you know, I'm not going to make that much money off of it, but, mm -hmm. I, but what it did to me is, you know, I'm still going to break even. I'm okay with that, but it got it into their freezers. They understand it and they'll come back, you mm -hmm. know, because one lady, one lady sent me a message and she want, she told me, she said, I haven't ate sausage since my dad passed away because I only liked the way that my dad made sausage. She's like, and that was 25 years ago. She's like, wow. your sausage is the closest to what my daddy made. And, you know, and that made me feel good, you know, mm -hmm. and that's a customer that's going to come for a fresh product instead of going to the stores now, you know, mm -hmm. and me mm -hmm. and her come, me and her come up with a deal to where I'm going to give her just fresh ground pork. Mm -hmm. Right. So she can make some of her own and can some of her own, but she still wants some of mine. So, and, and it would be cheaper for her to do it that way as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's just, you know, getting the products into the people's hands so that they understand. And even if you have to lose a dollar on it, you know, that's okay. You know, they, cause they will come back cause they can see the difference at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I did with the Mayshon. Cause I mean, on top of all that, we're starting with a, with a breed of pig that most people didn't even know how to pronounce the name, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so I did that, but that was more of a marketing strategy that I knew, um, what is it? My husband said, it's like a drug deal. First one's free. And then you'll come back and see us more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. But you know, I, I think that we, I think as small farmers, you know, we've said it a million times, we can't, we can't feed the world right now, you mm -hmm. know, no. but we can supply good food to the amount of people that we can produce for. You know, mm -hmm. it's just getting that out there and letting people understand because in reality, airs does have to be a little higher yes. because we're not matching. Right. Our yeah. inputs are higher. Yeah. Are well, higher. But it's just getting it out there. I do think too, that if we can find a way to really help understand, help people understand um, the benefits to buying in bulk, that that can really help. That could help. You yes. know, I know when we were in North Carolina here, we don't have the freezer space. Camper's not big enough for <laughs> freezers, <laughs> but, um, in North Carolina where we had our freezers for us, we would do a, a quarter cow. We had our pigs and then we, ha we raised our own chicken. I feel like if you can buy or raise food in bulk to put up, you can shop from your freezer all year long. You don't right. have yes. to. So if prices are going up, up, up at the stores, that doesn't matter. You bought it at this price from your local farmer and you've got it. It's there. Yeah. yeah. You have it for six months to a year, whatever it may be. And I feel like if we can help people better understand one, you're going to get, you're going to get a lot of meat for your dollar. But secondly, you're, you may be spending seven, $8 to buy ground beef, but you're also spending seven, $8 a pound to buy ribeye. And that's almost, that's impossible right now. So mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, the same thing with pork, lamb, whatever it may be, you're going to get a much better deal on things. It's a, it's a lot of money up front, but if you think about it from the perspective of, yeah, but then you're not spending that money throughout the year, you've already spent it. And so you're not going to feel the pinch from that in the months to come because you're just shopping out of your freezer. Mm -hmm. And I feel like more yeah. people can and that they're going to get a better a better deal on it buying in bulk versus buying in cuts and then it's there 
Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Laura. And most of my customers um, don't work in hanging weights and that's okay. They don't have to. Uh, and, yeah. and for those of you that don't know what a hanging weight is, that is when I take my hog to the processor um, and it's been scald scraped and gutted, I'll just leave it at that. Um, that is the weight that is on the rail and that is what I pay them per pound to process my pork. So yeah. um, when I when I talk to folks about that, I learned early on, they glaze over. And so what I realized is I had to put together a package or boxes that that resonated, that have a has a value and has savings in it. And that's OK. Um, but what I hear evolving through this conversation and where I think that the market needs to go for every consumer and every producer that's listening to this is is open, open your minds to the conversation for a long time. Small farms have been driven by hanging weights. Consumers, on the other hand, are marketed to in the nth degree and hanging weight is irrelevant. So there has to be an opening of the minds on both sides to figure out how you can come together and 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 help each other out through these things. No. Oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, let my dog. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, it, 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 in my opinion, I think that is that is the big message. You know, we know that all this is happening and we know, let's face it, y'all. I mean, we're the small farms, but these things that we're saying are not really working for us as small farmers. So so how do we change the conversation? How do we change it so we can talk to consumers more? How do we change it so that gives us more volume? How can the consumers approach us in a way that we can help each other? Do you think, though, that it's also a fear because of the lack of knowledge you know um, they can... on both sides absolutely yeah i think you know like people buying if they don't really know what they're like you give them a cut sheet they don't understand it right you know what i mean they know yeah, that I'll... they so they know they can go to the grocery store and they see pork chops and they can buy the pork chops Right. Yeah. I think cut cut sheets are intimidating, even to farmers, even, especially uh, startup farmers. They don't know what the cut sheet is. I've, I've talked several through it and I'm happy to do it. But, you know, the other part of it is a lot of consumers have been burned by that end product and, and they don't fully understand when they say a quarter cow and you get a rump roast. What is a rump roast? Nobody knows what that is anymore. You know, we yeah. don't even put that in our cow packages. Um, but there has to be a way, you know, um, if you're talking about cows, one of the industry issues, and I laugh because people get offended that I, like, I'm not supposed to know this ground beef on a cow is a problem. You know, you can always sell three or 16 ribeyes just like that. What you going to do with the 300 pounds of ground beef so that you can get to the next 16 ribeyes for that customer. You have to do a discount. You have to make bulk buys. You, you got to hustle. Um, yeah, so yeah. I think it's intimidating all around. Um, even with the Maishon, y'all know I'm, you know, queen of the Maishons and I've run dozens upon dozens, but we're at the point now that I could actually offer whole Maishons this fall. And I'm sitting here myself going, what does that look like? If I had to come to y'all and say, what's the price? What's the weight? What's the, this, what is it? Yeah. So how do I yeah. simplify it? How do I speak in my customer's language so that everybody is happy, satisfied, and well-fed in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it also goes back to convenience. We are a convenience world. Yes. It's not convenient to go to your locals. Right. You know, it, right. it takes more time. Sometimes you have to wait for a product. You can't, you know, yeah. the bacon's yeah. gone, my friend, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. What I'm seven you? miles outside of town, you know, so you gotta, you gotta make a point to come see me. Yeah. But, but it's just, it's making choices. You know, yes. you need as a country, as a country, we see that the choices being made by those over us are not the choices that are for us. You right. know, they're not so for our you, benefit. Yeah. So it, we need to make a choice to support those and be truthful, prideful Americans. Love yeah. that. Absolutely. I, I think that that's really what it boils down to in a lot of ways is, you know, America has been, I want to believe America was built on the American dream. And I think that we are losing so much of that. That sense of patriotism is not being instilled it hasn't been instilled in a lot of millennials. And I feel like it's, 
if we let that go, it's none of this is even going to matter. It'll matter to those of us with patriotic, we bleed red, white, and blue. But I think that um, for others, it's not, it's not even going to matter. And I think that we've just got to find a way, you know, to, to bring that back. Yeah. You know, bring that back yeah. And just be proud to support American, be proud to be an American and live the American dream, live life as a free American. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. A hundred percent. So man, we've, uh, we've touched on a lot of things today. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. And, and I wish that we could keep rambling on, but I got my uncle Benny out here and he is wanting to um, put up fence. So well, uh, <laughs> we understand the farm calls. You got to go. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but no, you know, I think that what we're doing is what needs to be done. And it helps bring awareness to those that are even in our communities that don't even know, you know, they yeah. see us on Facebook, but they don't understand the complexity of what is actually going on, you know? Right. And right. so us having these conversations and us putting it out there, you know, we didn't know until today what all China owned. And I'm still upset about the Nathan fucking hot dogs. I right. mean, it is whatever. But, you know, it's to get that out there and let people decide on what choice that they want to make. You know, it's a exactly. free world. Do what you want to do. But at the end of the day, it really ain't going to be free. That's right. No. Right. So, so anyways, y'all, y'all got anything to say before we go feed them damn hogs and them churros? I, I don't know. I feel like this is, you know, it's a long legged spider. I appreciate the opportunity to share my, my thoughts on it. And I think there's, there's more of us out there, like I said, and we'll keep talking about it. I love the podcast for the opportunity to talk about it. And if anybody yeah. listening has input, comment, send us an email, let us know what you think, good, bad, or ugly. And we're happy to keep talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Amanda. I was going to say, I agree. I think that this has been a good um, opening the door on this topic. I feel like we have a lot of other things to discuss kind of within the same food supply chain topic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And this is kind of scratching the surface or we're just opening the can of worms on this because I feel like there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, that we can really discuss on this. And I look forward to addressing those things in future podcasts. Oh, yes. Yes. I think, you know, we could keep on going on, but that will keep people wanting to come back for the next episode. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. That's right. All right. So I love y'all. I'm so glad to see you. Love you. How about y'all go feed them, feed them hogs, feed them churros, them quacking ass ducks and geese and to whatever <laughs> else you got. <laughs> All right then. Them, them Bye y'all. Them weird, them weird penis neck turkins, whatever you got. <laughs> <laughs> got two of those. Oh god. Got those too. My naked necks. <laughs> That's right. All right, y'all have a good one. Love y'all. All, All right, right, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye.